We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning ACC. How are you guys? All right. Hey, whether you're here in the lounge or online, we are so glad that you're here. Um, can everybody do me a favor? Just say click. All right, good, because we need to buckle up and get ready for where God's taking us this morning, okay? So now that we're ready, you got your seatbelts going. My name's John. Uh, I get the honor of serving ACC as one of our executive pastors. We have an amazing team, and I don't know about you guys, I love this series that we've been going through, you know? The last couple of weeks, we've had the opportunity to hear from Pastor Mike, we've heard from Pastor Matt, we've, we've heard about some of the ways that God has moved through history, you know, we've, we've heard about how God healed a, a woman with, with an ailment, resurrected the dead. Also, we heard about how Jesus multiplied the loaves and, and fed not just 5,000 men, but probably more like 15,000 people from just a few loaves and fishes, just very, very little. It's amazing what our God can do. Well, today we're going to continue on in, in looking at the miracles. And what I want you to understand as setting the stage is when we look at the Old Testament, we see moments of miracles throughout. One of those is actually when Joshua is in battle and he prays to the Lord and the Lord makes the sun stand still for an entire day. Like as far as like he, he gets an extra 24 hours or whatever. I mean, this, this daylight savings time has nothing on, on that moment, Okay. Um, but in addition to that, we also see Moses at the Red Sea, you know, and he takes the staff and he puts there, and the Lord breaks the sea in half and allows them to walk through the Red Sea on dry ground, something that only God can do. And we're going to hear a little bit more about things that only God can do this morning. But before that, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for how you love us how you are always interacting with us and working in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to recognize where we are right now, that you would help us to just leave the baggage outside at the door and to hear clearly what you have for us this morning. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. So as I've been putting together this message, I've been thinking about miracles and a couple thoughts came to my mind. One of those moments, I thought about how uh, many years ago, when I first started in ministry, we were living in rural Indiana, and in rural Indiana, it was really rural, okay? Lots of fields, and we were in the middle of a drought, and in this small country church, I remember that there was a call from, from the Christian radio station. They were calling for all of the churches that Sunday at a particular time to pray, and so that particular Sunday, we were all praying. And I remember our church, we, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was dry out. I mean, really dry out. And we came together and we began to pray and ask God to, to break open the heavens and bring the rain down and all this. In the midst of that prayer, together in unison as a community, we began to hear a little something on the steel roof. And then, torrential downpour. It was awesome. It was one of those moments where you look and you go, only God can. Can you turn to your neighbor and just say, only God can. You see, there are moments in our lives where only God can do what God does. I recall even in my own life, as far as my stepmom having MS, and she didn't know, but my grandma made one of those 1-800 phone call prayer hotline things, and the next day she woke up, and she felt different. And by noon, she called my grandmother. Now, my mom was just going to work and basically going to sleep. I mean, the MS was getting progressively worse. And she called my grandma, and she's like, I don't know what happened. It's gone. And she's like, God healed you. 
And then she told her what had happened. You see, I've seen miracles in my own life. The fact that I'm even up here is a miracle. God's done a miracle in my life, and I'm certain that he's done a a miracle in many, if not all of our lives, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. But I think that as we talk about miracles, you may have some questions, and so I want to give you a couple resources. One is, um, I want to make it really simple. C.S. Lewis wrote this book. It's called Miracles. Okay, so it's really simple. The other one is by Lee Strobel. It's called The Miracles Answer Book, okay? And this will help to answer some of your questions if you have them. But I think that as we talk about a miracle, what we probably need to define a little bit more what is a miracle. So here it is, according to this book. A miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature. For the purpose of showing God has acted in history. That God's acted in history. So the question is not whether or not God has acted in history at the end of the day, but rather do we attribute what God has done to him? I think that as we go into Mark 4 this morning and we look at the story of Jesus, I think it's important to kind of set the background to understand that Jesus has just got done telling some parables. And, and one of those parables is about, you know, you take some seeds and you put them in the ground and day and night the farmer just keeps on working and yet they grow and that the kingdom of God is like this. There are things that are happening under the surface that we know nothing about. But God is still moving. God is still acting even when we don't see it, even when we don't recognize it. So as we come to Mark 4, understand he's been telling these stories of the kingdom. In Mark 4.35, it says this, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I want to go with Jesus. So turn to your neighbor and say, I want to go with Jesus. Yeah, whatever we're doing, wherever we are in life, you want to go with Jesus because, listen, there are going to be some amazing things that happen along the way. There are going to be some amazing things that happen along the way. And I want you to see what happens next because this, they're going out on the water, they're on the Sea of Galilee, and it says, in the next verse, it says, but soon a fierce storm came. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Now, these aren't people who are not used to the sea, okay? You've got James and and John, and you've got Andrew and Peter, and these guys were fishermen before they became fishers of men and followed Jesus. So they're used to this, and yet, they're out there, the storms have come, and the question is, how are they going to respond to all this? But in the midst of this, the water is coming in. I mean, they're bailing it. I mean, if you, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen six-foot waves, and it can be kind of freaky, you know? You're like, oh my goodness, what's going to to happen? And so let's see how they respond. It says, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care? You ever feel like this in life? Like you're going through a situation, you're going through something, And you're like, God, do you even care what's going on in my life? And I think that the first thing that I want to say is this, you know, how do we respond to the storm? I think the first way that we respond is do it scared. And it may feel like, whoa, 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 what do you you mean do it scared? Do it scared. Be bold. Be courageous. First and foremost, it's important to understand Stress and anxiety are not a sin. I'm aware of the scriptures that say, you know, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Jesus says that. In Philippians, it says, you know, bring, don't, don't be anxious for everything. Bring, for, with anything, bring everything to God. Prayer, petition, I, I'm aware of those. But I also am aware that there was a moment, as we're entering into Holy Week right now, there was a moment during this Holy Week when Jesus was destined for the cross, when he was headed towards the cross to die for the sins of the world, for your sins and mine, 
when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and as he prayed and offered up to God, he, he, he went to the Father and said, Father, take this cup from me. If it's possible, if you're able, if anything, and just crying out to him. And in the midst of that cry, it says that he sweat, as it were, drops of blood. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've been stressed, I've had anxiety, all these things, but I've never sweat drops of blood. It's just never happened. But I have to imagine that Jesus was a little stressed out that day, and yet he never sinned. So understand, it's not a sin to have stress or, or anxiety. These things are going to happen, and, and uh, the question is, where do we begin where, where do we begin with it? Do we, do we bring these anxieties to God? Do we bring these stresses to God? Do we bring them to God and ask Him to act first and foremost? You know, do we come to Him, to him with prayer, getting into God's Word, maybe even worshiping, just simply saying, you know what, this is how I'm going to fight my battle. Getting into a life group and being in community where other people can lift some of your burdens. You see... It's important that we understand what we do with the situation that we're in. Do we offer it up to God? Do we believe that God can do exceedingly more than we ask or we can imagine? Well, let's see what the disciples do because picking up the next verse, it says, When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still! Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You know, the winds and the waves were silenced and still because creation is willing to submit to God. But the question is, are you willing? Are you willing to submit to God? I want to ask a question this morning. Where are you? Where are you? It's a very simple question, but it's a question that God asked in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were not in the right place, in right relationship with Him. Where are you? And I, I want to submit to you that there are four areas that you can be in. The first one, you can be in the desert. The desert is a place of solitude, but it's also a place that God meets people. He met Moses in the desert. He met Elijah in the desert. And when you're in the desert, it's important to remember the lessons that we learn in the desert. That's how we need to respond. Learn the lessons. The second one, the second place that you might be is the wilderness. And this is a tough place. The wilderness is a, a place of testing. It's a place of temptation. You'll recall that Jesus after being baptized, was led by the Holy Spirit out into the, the wilderness. And while he was in the wilderness, after 40 days, Satan came and tempted him. And it's interesting to see how he responds. He doesn't argue with Satan. Instead, he just quotes Scripture. And I think it's important for us to also do the same thing. When you're in the midst of the wilderness, if you haven't memorized some Scripture, I want to encourage you, find a couple of Scriptures. Find a couple of scriptures to memorize. And if you can't memorize that first, uh, something in your pocket that you can bring out and you can say that. Just respond with scripture. The third place is the open sea. And the open sea, it's a tough place as well. This is a place of drifting, a place of the unknown. Maybe it's, it's when you get that phone call with the bad news or, you know, you find a spot that you didn't expect or a lump or, or something like that and you're concerned. It's the unknown. Maybe something's happening at work. Maybe you lost a job and you're not certain of what to do next. Maybe there's something going on in your marriage. Whatever it is, it's, you just feel, you just feel like you're adrift, like you're out in the open sea. And in these moments, it's important to respond in two ways. Ask for courage and ask for direction. God, I'm asking for you to give me some courage right now. I'm asking that you would give me direction in the midst of this difficulty. And I believe that God will meet you right where you're at. The fourth, the fourth place is 
the vineyard. And this is the place that we all want to be. The vineyard is the place where, you know, there's, there's just abundance. There's, there's, there's a lot of growth going on. There's fruitfulness. Just life is good. Everything seems perfect. It seems like God is just smiling down on you. Don't you just love those moments? And these are the moments. These are the moments that we have to be on guard. Not in a paranoid way, but rather we need to be on guard because we know what happened in the Garden of Eden. Everything was going good there, and then suddenly Satan came in and started speaking some lies in the midst of all the goodness. We have to be on guard against the enemy. Because if you don't know it, there is an enemy. Satan would love, love to... to, distract us at the very least. And so this leads into our second point of how to respond to the storm. Learn to be still where you are on the way to where God is leading you, on the way to where God is leading you. Recognizing where you are and with God allows for an intentional response, for an intentional response, because it's important to also understand that even though you may be in the difficulties of life, You may be in the midst of broken relationships, addiction, stress, anxiety, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual healing is needed. God has not left us as orphans. He has not left you as an orphan. And you are not alone. There is nothing that we've ever experienced that we're the only ones. You may feel like it's only you, but I guarantee you, you're not the only one who has ever gone through what you're going through. So leave room for God to move in your life and look with expectation to the heavens for God to move. Now the question is, Jesus has just rebuked the winds and the sea has all been calmed and everything's good. And how do the disciples respond? It says in Mark 4, 41, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Not how we expected them to respond, but they were terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. This is not normal. This is not what we normally see. But it's a really important question. Who is this man? And I think it really boils down to three options. Lord, liar, or lunatic. Jesus is a historical figure. We cannot get, you can't get around that. And if you're exploring the questions of the faith. Maybe this is your first time here. We're glad you're here. This is a safe place to ask questions, any questions. But he's a historical figure. And if you say, well, I think Jesus is a liar. Well, you know, I've known a lot of teachers over the years. And I have to say, if I, my best teachers, if I found out that they were liars, I wouldn't say that they're a very good teacher, would you? And when I read the Gospels and I read about what Jesus taught, I don't see him as a liar whatsoever. I see a lot of truth bombs all over the place, along with those grace bombs. The second option is lunatic. Lunatic. Now, if if you're wondering what a a lunatic might look like, um, you know, I, I see a lot of lunatics on the road all the time, okay? Some of them are present. So in the midst of this, I don't see Jesus going around with chaos. Instead, I see him bringing order to chaos. A lunatic doesn't do that. A lunatic doesn't do that. I think back to a time being on a bus and seeing a guy growl at me. He seemed like a lunatic. He seemed like a lunatic for sure. But the the last option that we have is that he's Lord, that he is who he said he is, the Son of God. That he is actually God incarnate, who alone can calm the seas, can break the storms, can control everything. In the past with Moses and and with Joshua, guess what? They had to pray. Jesus just answers his own prayers. He's like, yeah, I got this. Done. And this leads to our third point of how to respond to the storms. Being still in his presence is what produces miracles. Being still in his presence is what produces miracles. Now, for some of you, you may be a little skeptical, but I want to give you also something very practical. You see, 
I think that there are ways to experience miracles. Yes, definitely pray. Definitely have people pray over you and such. But I want to share with you a study that went on. Lifeway Research reported on a recent poll of 40,000 people put on by the Center of Bible Engagement. And they talked about what's known as the rule of four. The rule of four. And it was the question of, What happens when people engage with the Bible on a weekly basis? And they asked the question, well, what if they engage with the Bible? They read it once a week, and they found there wasn't much difference. Two days a week, not a lot of difference either. Three days, not a whole lot of difference. But on day four, a lot of things began to change. A lot of things. If you read the Bible on average at least four days a week, things began to change to happen. Let me share some of those things. They found that when you engage the Bible, read the Bible four times a week, on a weekly basis, feelings of loneliness, feeling lonely, it dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Your curmudgeons could get in the Bible more is what they're saying. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. This is just reading the Bible. Alcoholism drops 57% as we engage with God in that. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Those of you who are single, especially if you're single and young, okay, you, I want to encourage you, get into the Bible. It will help you to have that self-control that God wants you to have. Feeling spiritually stagnant? You get into God's Word, it drops 60%. 60%. Viewing pornography, it drops 61%. And in this moment, if, if you're in the room or online or in the lounge and, and you're feeling like, I'm the only person who's struggling with this addiction, I want you to know, you're not the only one who's struggling with this. I guarantee you there are multiple people here right now who are dealing with this addiction on a daily basis. The statistics are baffling. But I also want to share a couple other statistics that I absolutely love. When you engage and read the Bible four days a week at least, I'm sure it multiplies as you go each day. You know, five days, six days, seven days. Sharing your faith jumps 200%. Discipling others jumps 230%. Four times a week, reading the Bible. You see, Jesus says that storms are going to come. But if we build our lives on his teachings, we are building on a rock, not on a foundation of sand. We were made to live where the sun stands still, the seas are made calm, and the storms are are silenced. It's a place of miracles where God fully reigns. And whether God says, I'm going to answer that miracle with a yes, a no, or a not yet, he will go through the storm with you. So this week, as we look at our what now God, I just want to make it really, really simple. Identify where you are. Where are you? And as you answer that question, decide your response. How are you going to respond to where you are currently? And for those of you who have not decided on whether Jesus is Lord, liar, or lunatic, it's time to start making that decision. Not just at the surface level, but at a heart level. Next week, Pastor Matt's going to be sharing the gospel. He's going to be baptizing people, and and maybe that's your next step. And and if you're like, I want him to be my Lord, don't let the day go by without talking to somebody about what it would look like to have a relationship with God. And finally, the rule of four. If you've been reading the Bible once, twice, three times a week, make the commitment to start reading the Bible four times a week because I guarantee you, you will begin to experience miracles of God in your life because of it. God has a miracle waiting for each and every single one of us, but it's in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you asking that you would do exceedingly more than we could even ask or even imagine and asking that you would help us to dig into your word, that you would help us to come to you with the storms, to be brave, to be courageous, even in talking to you. We ask for heaven to meet earth this day. We ask in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Thank you. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.